marriage is not a contract. So one of you probably all you probably heard people say things like, um, "We don't need to get married because I don't need a piece of paper to prove that I love this person." And maybe you've even said that kind of thing. And the church will say, you're right. You don't need a piece of paper to prove you love someone. That's a contract. And a contract is really good. A contract is super helpful. A contract is what? A contract is an agreement for an exchange of goods or services based off of a condition. So a contract is an agreement for an exchange of goods or services based off a condition. So if I need to re-roof the house, the contractor comes over, contractor, and um, <laughs> there's a contract. And the contract says, uh, give me this much money. I will re-roof the house. Then you pay me this much money. Great, in agreement for an exchange of goods or services based off a condition. And the condition is, if you don't re-roof the house, I don't owe you money. And if you don't pay me the money, I won't re-roof the house. Like, so if you don't do your part, I don't have to do my part. And that's the great thing about a contract is that, again, agreement for good exchange of goods or services based off a condition. And too many people go into marriage with that idea. Now, a lot of times people are deep, like these folks, you're deep and you're like, so you might hear like the idea of like, having a contractual approach to marriage. And you're like, no, 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 I don't have that. Because the, the shallow version is, well, as long as you stay cute, I'll keep coming home. Like that, that's shallow. And it's like, no, 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 I'm deeper than that. Okay, how about, how about this deep? How about as long as you stay, as long as you're kind to me, I'll be kind to you. As long as you're patient with me, I'll be patient with you. As long as you're faithful to me, I'll be faithful to you. Mm -hmm. And when we start getting to those places, then even deep couples are like, well, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, if they're not faithful to me, then I don't have to be faithful to them. If they're not faithful to me, this marriage is over. That's a contract mentality when it comes to marriage because a covenant mentality is what God reveals to us in the Bible. And the covenant is, if a contract is an agreement for an exchange of goods or services, I'll do this for you if you do this for me, based off a condition, a covenant is an exchange of persons that's unconditional. Basically, God says, I'll be your God, you be my people. That's it. I'm yours and you're mine. And so when a husband and wife or man and woman stand before each other to get married, they're not saying, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. In fact, actually, my, my uncle, my uncle uh, used to work out in Hollywood before he passed away. He was, uh, you know, the TV show Full House? Yeah. yeah. So he was one of the writers for Full House. Yeah. And Sister Sister, he did that. He's got a couple different Hallmark uh, cool. Christmas movies. It's just awesome. Anyways, so, but he uh, is, the, if you know, remember Full House, how like there's all one-liners, everything's one-liner. So he got married outside the church where he and his wife wrote their own vows. And so all of his vows were a joke. It was like, and, and Michelle, I'll do this if you do this. And I'll do this if you do this. And there's everyone's just laughing. It was super funny. And uh, I mean, I remember laughing at the time too. I thought it was hilarious. But then realizing, oh, every one of his vows was a condition. Man. Even though it was funny, even though it was entertaining, even though there's some meaning to it, every one of the vows was a condition versus when you get married in the Catholic church, there's no condition. You just say, I, Jack, take you, Jill, to be my wife. And I, Jill, take you, Jack, to be my husband. I'm yours and you're mine. And to realize is that even if you walk away, even if you don't do the thing you said you would do, we're still married. Because there no, there's no, you can't actually void a covenant. You can void a contract, but you can't void a covenant. And, and you know, Ch Ch Chesterton talks about this. Chesterton says, he said, people get so mad at the Catholic church because the church forces people to promise forever when they get married. <laughs> he says, but wait a second. That's what love wants to do. Like love wants to promise forever. So even if you weren't in the church, you would want, if you got married, you'd want to promise forever because love wants. I mean, so I always joke with our couples and say, I, It'd be like me saying, okay, here's what I have. I have the, the three different ver versions of the vows. I have the three-year vows, the seven-year vows, and the forever vows. Now, don't make any quick decisions. <laughs> Just like pray about it, talk about it. Let me know which vows you wanted to give next time you come back. And if someone, would, if someone were to say, like, I like those seven-year vows. The other person says, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to give you my 20s. Like, that's not what I'm promising you, my 20s. I'm promising you either I want to love you for the rest of my life, no matter what, or we need to go separate ways. Because that's what the heart, human heart wants. And the crazy thing is, the human heart also wants what? Unconditional love. Where do you have the opportunity to actually love someone unconditionally? The promise that no matter what happens, I will love you unconditionally, without a condition. I can never void, well, no matter how bad you leave fail, it will never actually void my love for you. Sacrament of matrimony. And so the deepest heart, deepest desire of the human heart actually the church gives you a way to promise that and gives you a way to live that out. 
love wants to make a vow. Yeah. I have that total yeah. commitment and love wants to be received. I want that other person to be committed to me. That's what we're longing for. And the heavy, heavy part about that is then even if that person walks away, even if the other, it's a risk. It's a huge risk because the person who covenants themselves to you, they might just change their mind. Mm -hmm. And to realize that if they change their mind and walk away, you're still married. If they change their mind and walk away and get married to someone else, you're still married to them. That means that even if they walk away, you're not free to date. You're not free to pursue any other romantic relationship. You are a married person and your spouse happens to live somewhere else. And that's the heaviness because the great part about it is like, oh my gosh, you're made for this. This is incredible. And this is the risk. But that's the part of it too, is that one of the things we realize, and we keep accenting this, when it comes to matrimony, I don't know how many different weddings I've been part of where it's like, what you're watching is you're watching two people risking their entire future for this person sitting next to them. That's, what, that's what's happening. Every time someone gets married, they're risking, they have no idea. They know that the person they're marrying is a flawed human being. They know the person they're marrying is broken. They know they're broken. And yet they're saying, if this doesn't work, nothing will work. Mm. Yeah, and it's a big risk. You worry the other person could leave. But you know, I think many Catholics could come together and go, I don't think the other person is going to leave. They have some yeah. confidence. But there's still a risk of this other person is going to hurt me. Yeah. This other person is going to let me down. This other person is going to make mistakes. And uh, I'm going to be frustrated. And, and that's I think that's the reality of married life. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And, and you're constantly being invited in those moments to actually love. So I just I, we, we just gave a talk on marriage earlier today, actually, and I shared a story. Uh, just uh, that I, I wrote Beth a letter recently. Just I left it, left it on the like pillow. yesterday. Yesterday, <laughs> really recently. Really recently, <laughs> yeah. And, and I and one of the lines was I just said you know I was just very I was in prayer and I just thought I'm going to write my wife a letter here. He this doesn't morning. do that every day. Uh, yeah, this doesn't happen every day. <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> but I but in the letter I was just thinking of her a number of things. But I said and I want to thank you for being so patient with me when I was so impatient with you. Mm. And, and I think that's something in, in, in marriage, going back to the contract thing, if marriage is a contract, it's like, well, I'll be, I'll be kind to you if, if you're kind to me. And yeah. I'll be patient with you if you're patient. Well, I, I, I wasn't patient with my wife recently. <laughs> uh, and, and I apologized. And, but she was very patient in the way that she handled it. Like she didn't just get, why are you being this way? You know, she just came and was calm and just said, you know, are you sure you want to? <laughs> she called me on it, but in a very gentle way. But that, that's the real stuff of married life. And the word vulnerable, which you're talking about, the vulnerability, it hit me recently. Like, you get back to the roots of that. Volnus means to be able to be wounded. Yeah. So we like to praise vulnerability in our modern days. Like, oh, be authentic, be real, be vulnerable. But you're vulnerable as someone, they can come in and hurt you even more. Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what you open yourself up to when you get the ring and say the vows and one thing I like to compare marriage to is the um, roller coaster at Disneyland, Space Mountain. Are you familiar with that? Space Mountain is marriage because you and your spouse get in that car and you buckle your in, yourself in. You are there together 100% and you don't know where you're going because <laughs> yeah. it's in the dark. The roller coaster in the dark. You could be going up. You could be going down. You could be going sideways, upside down. You don't know what you're going to hit in your marriage. You know, you could struggle with infertility, hyperfertility, child with special needs. You could have a sick spouse. You know, you could have a greater tragedy. You just don't know when you make that vow to one another, when you're rooted in Christ, what journey your love is going to take you on. But that's the beauty of it. It reminds me of that, that quote you often like to mention from St. Francis de Sales. Yes. Um, in marriage, one takes a vow, but it is the only instance where a vow is taken without a novitiate. Because if there were a novitiate for marriage, how few would enter into it? <laughs> Did he it. actually say that? He yeah, actually said that. It's one of, one of his letters. That's great. Yeah. Because you're great. thrown into it, right? Yeah. And, and right. you have to all of a sudden, you know, you think you know the person and you do to a certain level, but then you're thrown you into really this know. reality called marriage and all of a sudden all these other things pop up in the first months, in the first years, after a few kids. And, and, and it's like, whoa, this is a lot harder than we ever, we, we ever imagined. One thing someone wrote in a card on our wedding day, which I have written many times, um, is the quote saying, the priesthood, which is analogous to marriage, has been more terrible and more wonderful than I ever imagined. Here's to you. Ter you're terrible and wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So true. Completely. You, just, you don't know till you're in it. There's a, I make the analogy a bunch of times when, when people are coming into the church, 
So a lot of times when people are in RCIA, I don't know, is, is anyone here in RCIA right now? A couple of people, that's awesome. Um, so what can, what can happen sometimes is as we're getting closer and closer to the Easter Vigil is there's this like, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I'm ready. And uh, I remember uh, Rick, w one year in our diocese, we had six men, seven men ordained to the priesthood, which is really big for the Diocese of Duluth. And I went back, I said backstage, went back to the sacristy, talked to some of these guys. And I was like, hey, um, so how are you guys feeling? Are you ready? And uh, are you prepared? And one of the brothers, he looks and he says, well, I'm sufficiently prepared. <laughs> I thought, that's an amazing answer because there is no way to be prepared. There's no way to be prepared for the, light, the priesthood. There's no way to be prepared for what God's calling you to as a Catholic. And there's no way to be prepared completely for marriage, but I can be sufficiently prepared. And that's, that's part of what marriage prep is all about is that, okay, I, there is going to be curveballs that I could never anticipate, but I'm sufficiently prepared to be able to take a swing. Anything else you do in here? Oh, yeah. yeah. So you have the syllabus, go, you have the class. the beginning of covenant. We haven't even gotten to sacrament and vocation there. And then, oh, man, I love this thing called the, we, we use the focus inventory, which stands for facilitating open couple communication, understanding, and study. And so basically they take about 162 uh, statements and say, I agree with this, I disagree with this, I'm uncertain. So my future spouse and I have discussed and agreed the way we'll make use of credit in our financial relationship or something like this. Um, and so we go through all of those and that becomes kind of the skeleton for talking about big, big things. Because one of my favorite, well, a couple of, I have a couple of favorite questions or statements. One is, there are certain behaviors and habits in my future spouse that sometimes annoy me. Super fun, I love that one. Because the preferred answer is yes. The preferred answer is agree. Like, yes, there are certain behaviors and habits in my future spouse that sometimes annoy me. And the, the organization wants you to say yes because it means A, the shine is worn off. Like, you know, the person's not perfect. B, um, they know that you know <laughs> that they're not perfect. And C, you're free to be actually be able to say that. Yes. Because it's one thing to kind of like, I know you know, but don't say anything about this. And another thing to be like, yo, yeah, we can joke about this. So then I we used to say, oh, okay, so what is the thing about each other that you find annoying? And I don't do that anymore. What I do is I say instead, um, so what is it that you think Ted would say about Ooh, you? That's good. And that's better that's because really they get to good. own it themselves yes, yes. as opposed to Perfect. let me get started, you know? Right. <laughs> actually, they say, actually, then that never bothers me. And not as much as this, you know? Yes. Um, but then the next question, the next question is, is, was potentially devastating. So the first one is kind of lighthearted. Certain behaviors or habits sometimes annoy me. The next question is, there are parts of my future spouse's character that I do not respect. And that one is just, whenever that's flagged, it's like, yes, I agree with that. It's like, okay. Um, so I don't know if you accidentally said, and, but we just dive into it because you have to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Because um, have you guys heard of a guy, guy named Dr. John Gottman? Yes. Dr. John Gottman, he's a, a therapist, a psychologist. He and his wife, um, he's studied uh, couples such a, to such a degree from a sociological perspective, but he's a Christian. Um, He's, he's studied couples so often, so much, so thoroughly that he says that he can identify, simply observing a couple having a conversation for 15 minutes about anything, he can predict with 90% certainty whether or not they'll be divorced in the next three years. That's what he claims. Because what he would do is he'd take these couples and put them in an environment where they're kind of like away for the weekend and he would strap on like uh, EKG machines and blood pressure monitors and just... In, they, they know they're being monitored and, and just have them live for a weekend. And he could, he noticed these things. There were four behaviors that in these couples that he called the four horsemen, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because if they were present, that meant the end was nigh. And the first one is critique. Um, those different than criticism. The criticism would be like, I asked you to bring home the dry cleaning for the last two days. You promised you would, and you didn't do it. That's just legit criticism. Critique is, I asked you for the last two days to bring home the dry cleaning. You didn't do it. You don't care about anyone but yourself. That's like taking this particular, making a generalization. It's a big attack. Um, the second is defensiveness. And there's three kinds of defensiveness, at least. There's the aggressive defensiveness. You didn't pick up the dry cleaning. Oh, yeah, well, you didn't do such and such. That's aggressive defensive. There is deflective defensive, which is you didn't pick up the dry cleaning. Well, you know what? I was so busy. I had this, this, and this. Okay. And there's also the worst one. I, mean, I think it's the most insidious one where it's... Um, it's the low grade defensiveness. And maybe you've seen this. And this is one of those things where um, I always ask couples, is it, we've all seen it. It is the low grade defensiveness is to watch a couple tell a story about like their weekend or about their Christmas or about their last vacation. 
sometimes there's like the, or how you met. Like, oh, I was at the malt shop. <laughs> I was uh, driving my car and, and she was on the side of the road. Like, no, you weren't driving your car. You were in a motorcycle. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, I was on a motorcycle. Crazy. I can't believe I forgot that. Thank you for reminding me. And it's just fun versus I was driving my car and you didn't drive your car. It was a motorcycle. Why? Like what? I'm telling a story, aren't I? Have you ever seen a couple? They, they're telling a story and you're just cringing the whole time because the correction is not happy. The correction is not like, oh yeah, thank you. It's, oh, why do you always jump in? That low-grade defensiveness is a sign of we don't trust each other. And there's this, this remarkable, because then what I mean, I've seen this in my family a bunch. So speaking of the story, a couple uh, Thanksgivings ago, we are flying down to celebrate Thanksgiving at my older brother's place in North Carolina. And so we came in at different times. I came in way ahead of my family. And there's a big snowstorm. And uh, so I met them at the gate. I'm like, Dad, man, how was the drive? He's like, uh, you know, no problem. It just went slow. And there was, a, there was a car that spun out in our lane right ahead of us. My mom stepped in. She's like, you didn't see that car. He's like, I didn't say I saw the car. He's like, yeah, well, you made it sound like you saw the car. And he's like, I didn't make it sound like I saw the car. And I just like, this is weird. <laughs> <laughs> but my dad just let it go. And we went on with the rest of the night. The next morning, this is, this is what happens with this though. What happens the next morning, we're at this Airbnb going to my brother's place after breakfast. My mom's sitting at the kitchen table and we're all getting ready. And my dad's like, hey, we're going to go over to Mark's place now. She's like, I know. He's like, we're going to Mark's place now. I was like, wow, that went from zero to 60. Oh, that was from last night. That was like, that was in the holster. That was in the chamber for since, since the gate when we arrived because this was the low grade defensiveness where, okay, we're not trusting each other. And they're amazing. They've been married 56 years. But sometimes, right, sometimes it doesn't work out I mean, perfectly. But there's aggressive defensive, deflective defensive, and low-grade defensive. The third is, so what do we have so far? Critique, defensive. There's also stonewalling. Stonewalling is, have you guys know what stonewalling is? It's, I never got it for so long until I just kept reflecting on it and then saw it. Here's what stonewalling is. Stonewalling is, um, Here's the guy, he goes to the little window, he looks out, he's like, oh, little bird out there. And his wife can either say, are you kidding me? When you, when you, since when did you get into birds? She could say, uh, I don't care about birds right now. Or she could just go, huh. Or she could say, wait, where? Well, right over there, oh, okay. So stonewalling is someone makes a bid. And how you respond to that bid either is I'm acknowledging it or I'm just dismissing it. Stonewalling is just like this, you know? So someone comes home and says, I had the worst day today. You think you had a bad day, da, da, da. So I'm not, first made the bid of saying, I had a tough time, meet me down here. I'm not gonna meet you down there. Or say I had an awesome day. Like, oh really, was that good? Or just kind of like the, the worst is like the, huh. Cause the, the bid is, hey, meet me up here. I had a great day. No, I'm not going to. Stonewalling. The, the insidious thing about stonewalling is you can do it and get away with it. Yeah. Like, why are you always like this? What do you mean? Why am I always like this? I didn't do anything. Exactly. And so one of the things I, I'll, this, this resonates so thoroughly with our couples because they're like, oh man, I can see that. I didn't have a name for it, but I know that sometimes I'm just tired and I, and she made a bid and I didn't want to meet her. Or mm. I, I knew that I was distracted and he made a bid and I just, I don't care about how the Vikings did, you know, that kind of a situation. I don't care about, <laughs> I get this a lot. Like these women who are like, I don't, don't say another thing about Jordan Peterson. I don't care about Jordan Peterson, <laughs> but the guy's like, Jordan Peterson's my man, you know? And it's like, that's enough. He's making a bid though. I, here's a, here's a thought I've been thinking about lately. I want to share it with you. If she just, huh, that's so long. And what's he going to do? I'm not going to share my thoughts with you anymore because you don't care. So critique, Defensiveness, stonewalling, the fourth is the worst, and that's contempt. Now, I don't have to describe contempt because you all know it. The reality, of course, J Gottman says, is, and this is what we bring our couples through, all four are going to be present at some point just because we're broken. Like, here's my mom and dad, 54 years. They're that Thanksgiving, we're broken. It's going to be, but he says, but if we can hit the golden ratio, and the golden ratio is, something around five to one or seven to one, acts of kindness, love, respect to every one, stonewalling, critique, defensiveness, contempt, then you're gonna still be happy. You'll still, be, you'll still have health because there's enough trust here built up that like, yeah, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said that. 
I trust you. I know you, I know you actually love me. I know you actually respect me because the seven to one or five to one, you're, you're putting into the trust bank. You're putting into the love bank. And, uh, does that make sense? Sorry, I went on and oh, on. For yeah, that. No, this is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> this is really great. Stuff. This is literally what we talk about in marriage prep. So <laughs> it, it just reminds me, even in our marriage, there's times when you just like, we're, we're really close, we're connecting really well. And then there's a stressful time just recently. <laughs> and we're, you know, we're driving out here and kids are sick and it's just, it's hard. Um, but I remember you saying something like, you know, hey, we've been doing really well here, but I, you know, you're, you're getting a little stressed, Ted. And uh, well, it's like, let's stay in the same space, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. do yeah. not leave the building, you know, yeah. like. Let's bring it down, buckle it in. <laughs> yeah, me a lot. Yeah, yeah. you're completely with each yeah. other all the time. Right. We were talking about being extroverts or introverts, and they said, "Father Mike, are you an introvert or extrovert?" I'm like, "I'm 100 percent, not 100 percent, but very heavily introvert." And uh, I need that. You know, sometimes what you don't have a place to escape to. It's like, woof, duh. Woof. But would you, you know, what you're describing, going out to the the four things that he mentions that horseman. you can follow the, the horseman, yeah, that you can fall into. <laughs> uh, and then how we want to have the ratio seven to one. That's just fascinating that, you know, yeah. here is he's scientifically trying to. Well, there's also know, people who will say that, you know, three to one's way too low. You need yeah. many more acts of kindness and trust and love. Mm -hmm. Also, I've heard a psychologist say, Jordan Peterson, say that <laughs> 11 to one is you need more, you need more kickback. You need more tension or else the other person's just a pushover and you start to not respecting them because they're too much of a pushover. Mm -hmm. You need someone to contend with, he says. Now, that doesn't mean they always have to be acts of defensiveness or stonewalling or contempt, but it means there's some kind of person you married to someone you can contend with, not simply someone who just can agree with everything you say and think that you're perfect, but go back but to the, the whole process though. It just, I think that's what the sacrament is, is doing. Yeah. It's, it's changing our hearts to love like Jesus. You know, point. Jesus is not yeah. three to one, seven to one, 11 to one. He's you know, infinite, yeah. you know, uh, and it's perfect love. Now, none of us are going to get there in this lifetime, but grace really does change our hearts. You know, we probably go into the marriages, uh, Aaron, I know a little, uh, as you get into it and things get hard, it, you, you may have moments where it is more two to one, three to yeah. one or something like that. Yeah. But, but, but through the sacrament, God changes our heart to love like he loves on Good Friday, where he's patient when the other person is frustrating us. And he's, you know, he was misunderstood. He was not appreciated on Good Friday. There were hurtful words spoken on Good Friday to yeah. Jesus, hurtful actions, you know, all these things. And yet he still loved. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think many people think of marriage that way. They think of marriage, you know, it's like, oh, I finally found someone that's going to fulfill me. And yes, I'll lay down my life, Ephesians 5 and, you know, sir. But, but ultimately I'm looking at this other person as someone that's going to fulfill me. Whereas if you look at marriage is the cross, right? And, and you look at the cross, you know, like Jesus isn't up there going, oh, this is awesome. I'm living the dream. You know, it, yeah. he's laying down a life. It hurts, but it's beautiful. That's what we're made for. We're made for that total self-giving. Well, I always say that marriage is where bad people go to die. <laughs> Quote me, tweet that. Marriage, marriage is where bad people go to die to themselves in order to live in love. Yeah, right. But, but I would say that... Um, like you guys, you're describing this. One of the critical virtues of marriage is hope. Because as you said, you get married and it's like, wait, I thought it would be, you guys, this is the reality. Of course, especially with Catholics who have, a, if you've had great um, models of marriage in your life, sometimes you have the hardest time in those first months and years of marriage. Because it's like, no, I saw my parents as pros. Like my parents were professional lovers. <laughs> they were incredible. They, my, the way my dad cared for my mom and the way my mom like, respected my dad, all these kind of things. And you remember them as a, after having gone through all of those ups and downs that then you find yourself in this marriage going like, oh, wait, this, we just stepped on each other's toes. You just stepped on my toes on purpose. Like all these kind of pieces to hold on to that virtue of hope. Because expectation, I always say expectation is a killer of joy. Expectation ruins more future expectation ruins more present joy than anything else. I thought it would be like this, but it's not actually, it's like this instead. Anticipation is great because I love anticipation. Like I don't, that's why I don't like surprise parties. Like I, I like the idea of like, let me look forward to it. Cause usually the actual thing is not as much fun as looking forward. anyways. But expectation is I thought it would be like this. So marriage needs hope because once we get inside of it and realize, Oh, this is not what I expected but I still have hope that we can make it through this. Mm -hmm. I still have hope that this isn't the end just because we just hurt each other pretty badly here. This isn't the end just because, wow, we're really struggling uphill. Or even like you mentioned, I just, it's so important to realize, to, I, mean, I don't know how many people here are discerning marriage actively right now, meaning you're in a relationship. <laughs> and okay, great. Um, 
one of the things I invite people to reflect on is the vows. So I, I, Jack, take you, Jill, to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love you and honor you all the days of my life. And reflect on bad and reflect on sickness and reflect on um, the other one. <laughs> uh, like for, for reflect on like how bad could it be? What if the other person gets sick and they can't take care of themselves in our first summer? What if we can't get pregnant? What if we can't not get pregnant? <laughs> what if, what if I'm the one who's sick? I know people, I actually talk to people who say, um, I don't want him to stay with me if I'm the sick one. Cause I don't want him to have to give, give, spend the rest of his life just caring for me. Oh, like that movie. What was that movie? And, and you before just, me or something. Yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And it's just like, yeah, but that's what you're saying yes to. That's what you're vowing. Right. And uh, that's why I think it's so important to say, okay, <laughs> sometimes we are uh, catastrophizers, right? We always think a worst case scenario. There's sometimes that's not healthy. This might be a case where it's really, really good to do to actually, and actually do that out loud with them. Okay, what's the worst thing I can imagine happening in our marriage? Let's talk about that. Am I saying yes to that too? And not that I want that to happen, but like, let's bring it to the Lord. Um, I failed and I wasn't faithful to you. Okay. Um, are we still one? You were faithful, unfaithful. Are we still one? I mean, we're sick. We have multiple children with multiple issues. What happens then? Not because we want to be negative Nellies, but because that's what life is. Remember, I think Bishop said it this morning. He said, life is hard, but there's hope. I love I loved how Bishop this morning, yeah. I mean, I think the best, well, my thing that resonated most with me was when he was so vulnerable, yeah. right? And he shared that he had to take time away from his diocese and had to get help. He had to seek help. He's just like, oh my gosh. Because what do we think about bishops? We're like, no, mm -hmm. dude, they promote bishops because they don't get, they don't struggle because they don't get overwhelmed by stress because they're really, they have everything under control. Here's a bishop in front of his brother bishops, in front of his brother priests, in front of all of us saying, actually, you know, I needed time away. It wasn't like, I'm taking a sabbatical. He could have easily said that. He could have said, I just needed some time away to kind of collect myself. He said, no, I was so broken that this is what I needed. And if I didn't get it, I would have collapsed um, and realized that that could be your marriage. That could be my priesthood. And that could, because why? Because life is hard. 